Thanks for joining for Growing Seedlings Indoors. And Caleb, I am ready to hand it over to you if you're set to share your screen. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll start sharing and we'll get into it. Um, hello everyone, thank you for joining us. There we go. Looks like, I think I've got it up set. Looks okay on your end? Looks yeah. great. Great. So we're going to be talking about um, growing seedlings indoors and you know how to, how to get it ready for your garden this year. I uh, aimed this talk uh, at a beginner audience, knowing that there's a lot of people taking up gardening for the first time. Hopefully there's still good information for folks who have gardened before. Um, and uh, if there are experienced gardeners that want to throw out you know, their recommendations for what's worked for them in the past in the chat, by all means, please do. And uh, we'll get into it. Let's see if I can do this with my keyboard. There we go. So what are we going to talk about today? Why we're starting seeds indoors and, and what crops really we're focusing on a bit. Uh, when to direct seed, uh, you know, just plant in the ground when it's warmer uh, versus just buying seedlings instead of starting your own. Uh, you know, just a little bit of like, just some perspective of uh, sometimes you can do things and it doesn't mean that it's worth doing it, uh, but that all varies. You know, gardening is very personal. There's many ways to do it. Um, I'm gonna get a, spend a bit on seed biology and seedling biology, because that's really what's driving this whole thing. Um, and uh, let me just close something here. Okay, oops. And what you need to get started, you, you know, a potting mix, your containers, your lights, etc. when to start planting, and that's one that you can be can vary quite a bit, but we'll talk a little bit about that and then go through some of the common issues. And if we have time, I have just some photos uh, that that some folks were kind enough to share with me that we can talk about, you know, point out what works great for this situation here, what maybe doesn't, etc. So why do we start seedlings indoors? Uh, one of the main reasons is that some of our crops need more growing time before frost happens or before we start harvesting. Um, so for cool season crops, onions and leeks, uh, onions, they're, they're day length sensitive. So after we get to those really long days of midsummer and the days start shortening, that's when the onions start to bulb up and you kind of, you, you, you can't really get them to grow any bigger after that point. So the plants need to start soon enough that they have a good amount of growing time before that day length really tells them when to, to stop growing. Uh, leeks are a little different. Those are just a very long season crop. And so they, they take many days to get to the maturity that you want to harvest. They, but they don't care about the cold. Like you're not starting them early indoors because you're worried about frost getting them because a the light frost is not gonna hurt either of those. Uh, it's just that, you know, right now I'm looking at a lot of snow out my window and there's no way that you could get started in there, but you can get started indoors and get the plant up and running. Brussels sprouts are similar. They just take a long time to mature, but it's not like you're worried about getting them um, out of the garden before frost because they actually taste better after frost. Artichokes is a, a weird one. That's actually a biennial, meaning it in its natural setting, it grows the first year and then the second year it makes the flowers that we harvest. But around here, we don't, it won't overwinter. So we have to trick it into thinking it's been in two, two um, years. So there's some varieties that help with that, but the varieties that we buy around here, you start them and you trick them into thinking that they've then gone through a mild winter. Uh, you know, you get them started where they're growing and then you put them somewhere cold. Um, and so that's one reason why it's really good to have them somewhere portable in a seedling tray or something like that. And then heat loving crops. This is one where it's partially just, we wanna be harvesting them for as long as we can before frost ends that. So melons, they're very cold sensitive. Tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, none of those can tolerate the frost. So we need to get a big enough plant going in the summer, you know, so we're not worried about frost outdoors anymore. We can go plant them. And then we want to be able to harvest for as long as possible before frost comes again and ends it. 
and then also similar with um, annual flowers like zinnias or something like that, where they'll keep flowering if you keep deadheading them and, and take care of them. And you just want them to continue flowering for as long as possible so you can enjoy them for as long as possible. So my example here, here's a, a, a melon from the Johnny's catalog. And you can see right next to its name, uh, there, it says 75 days, which means 75 days until you can start harvesting melons. Uh, if we look at Maine and you think about, I just said, you know, melons really can't take the cold. It's not even just the frost. This is our last frost date map. Um, and, and probably melons, even though, say, you are not likely to get a frost after June 1st, it still might be good to not plant them outside until it's a little warmer, maybe the second or third week of June. But we'll go with June 1st for our example. So June 1st plus 75 days means you're harvesting in mid-August. And I mean, here in Maine, that's not too far away from frost. So uh, you, you really, you want to make sure you're not too late. You know, we, we've just got kind of a short window. And so having a, a seedling started indoors helps us with that. And then if you look at the Johnny's catalog in the melon section, they'll say that days to maturity, that 75 days, that's from the point you transplant from when you put it out into the garden. If you're direct seeding in the garden, you have to add 10 days to that. So if you're not direct seeding until June 1st, then it's really looking like late August and you may not even get a melon, let alone the fact that those days are cooler and melons taste sweetest in the hot, dry summer months. Uh, so then we look at the same, same page of the catalog. Here's the growing information on melons. Um, you want to start them indoors about a month before you're planting them out. Maybe not a full month. Uh, melons are one, it's going to vary crop by crop, but melons are a good example of you don't want a seedling that's too large. So say you started it in April, but you're not planting it out until June, uh, you might get a, a pot, a plant, a seedling that's, that's not going to do as well as if you had started it in mid-May. Um, and that is just something that it's going to be crop by crop. Some crops don't care as much, uh, and we, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So another reason to give seedlings a head start, uh, uh, to start seedlings indoors, is to give them that head start. So that by the time the, the warmth is there to drive the growth outdoors, and there's big long days, that you've got a big enough plant to really take advantage. Because when you start from a seed, you just get these little seedlings and that's tiny leaves and they can only collect so much solar energy and create so much sugar to drive growth. So if you start that process indoors, the plant goes out and you can kind of hit the ground running. Uh, at least that's the hope. Um, and also if you start with a, a transplant outdoors, uh, you know, you have freshly disturbed the soil your transplant's already this big, whereas the weeds that you just disturbed and those seeds that you just brought up, they're gonna start sprouting and your plant's already shading them out a little bit. That's the hope. And it's similar, it's less time for pests and disease to find the plants. So tomatoes, that's the most common starts indoors. Uh, these ones are, are ready to go in the ground. This is actually a farmer that's gonna put them in a greenhouse, um, but it's the same principle. That's about the size that, you know, that's, that's a really nice ideal size uh, and it's ready to go. It's not too big. Uh, it's okay to be smaller, uh, but you don't want to go much bigger than that. But you, and there are ways to get around that. And uh, another reason to start indoors is that you can really control the germination conditions. And I'll show a picture of, about that. And you can get really nice spacing in the garden. One of the most common problems for beginning gardeners is they crowd things to, too close together. Because when you plant a seedling, you plant transplant, it's hard to, to really have a visualization of how big that plant's going to get. And uh, the tighter they are, the, the less room, the less water, nutrients, and sun each plant has. So each plant can't do quite as good. Um, and also you can get some disease issues just because they're crowded and they don't dry off and, and you get wet leaves and that can lead to disease problems. So hey, Kayla, my first, yes. One question, one person wondering if you could say how tall those tomatoes were that you just showed. Uh, I can guess. So those pots are uh, three and a half inches by three and a half inches. So if you think about that as your scale, that's about three and a half inches. 
So three and a half, seven, ten, they're about a foot tall. Um, it's more about the developmental stage and how crowded out the root ball is. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So when I start my first peas of the year, um, I've, I, I'm impatient. I'm ready to go. These are seedlings that I transplanted into my garden last year. And, uh, you know, when you have cold soil and wet soil, it's really tough conditions for most seeds to start. Even though peas are better with that than many other plants, peas like the cool, um, I was able to start these indoors and put them out. And then you've got a plant that's able to get going. Whereas if you direct seed, you know, some of those seeds are gonna get eaten by pests. Some of them are gonna uh, succumb to disease and they just won't ever really make it to then continue growing. Um, and whereas some, you'll see on lists of like things to transplant, things not to transplant, a lot of people say don't transplant peas. And honestly, you don't have to, uh, but I'm impatient. So for my goals, I really wanted those up and running. Um, and then I would direct seed some other ones later in the year. Uh, and, and that, as you figure out uh, what you're doing, you know, you just figure out which ones work for you. For a lot of people, there's no reason to transplant peas. Um, and oftentimes that indoor seedling space that you're starting with is at a premium. You know, it takes up a lot of space. And so you, you just are going to make it work for you. But for me, when I need to get peas in, that's, that's one of the ways I do it. Uh, and then similar to that spacing, uh, you can save on seeds by transplanting because uh, you're less likely to lose them to disease that you might get if you're um, direct seeding out in the ground you're also able to get that spacing really well-defined. You know, you want, you know, two plants per six inches of row or something. Um, well, one of the ways you do that when you're direct seeding is you usually seed more than you expect, and then you thin out the plants. You, you remove some, uh, which is great, uh, but it just is more seeds that you're, you're using. Um, and uh, right now, this year, I'm sure a lot of people are suffering from this. There's so many people taking up gardening uh, that the seed companies are having a hard time keeping up with demand. They have the seeds. It's really the bottleneck is just getting them into uh, small packets for garden scale growers. Uh, so I'm sure lots of people can uh, commiserate with unavailability of seeds. And then for me, part of the reason to start seedlings as door is for the fun of it. Uh, basically, I rush spring. Like right now, the sun's, the days are already longer, the sun is already stronger, and I'm like, you know, itching. I will give the caveat that that's not a great impulse with starting transplants. Um, I'm going to try to really hammer on it today. It's much better to, to start your seedlings later than it is to start them early. Uh, starting them early can really just lead to more issues, and you might get a uh, a less vigorous start than if you had just direct seeded. Um, that's often the case with like winter squash. I always start mine early and I have these big plants to go in the garden and I, they take up all sorts of space in my house and um, I have to keep moving them to bigger containers when really I probably could have direct seeded outdoors at the same time that I finally get those transplanted and I probably would have just as good a winter squash crop in the end, but I'm just too impatient. <laughs> I think I like to make, give myself more work. I don't know. So some of the commonly direct seeded crops, the ones that aren't usually transplanted, short season crops, things that grow quickly. Um, uh, head lettuce, more likely to be direct seeded versus lettuce mix, more likely, or sorry, head lettuce, more likely to be transplanted versus lettuce mix, more likely to be direct seeded because you can just direct seed a, a solid line of lettuce mix, uh, whereas a head lettuce, you want to give it like a foot of space between each each plant. And so you might as well have a transplant that you're plopping in. Um, they also transplant well. Arugula, you could transplant it. It would do just fine, but it's a lot of work for little plants that, you know, you're just going to harvest uh, not too long ago. Similar with, uh, with turnips and radishes. Um, some of the ones that are difficult to transplant, carrots, parsnips, Yes, you can transplant carrots and parsnips, but it's really tricky and it is like, it, 
unless you have really hard time getting your carrots to, to work in the garden, uh, it's usually not worth the effort. Uh, and there's a lot of ways it can go bad. Beans, that can be similar, and peas, some people find them hard to be transplants. Uh, if you wanna do it, you can get your first planting of beans and peas in as transplants. Just don't start too early. They, they don't wanna sit around in a, a small container for long. They wanna be out and let the roots out into the full soil. And that's where the pea, a lot of these issues come up is um, when the root ball is too overcrowded in whatever container you're using to start your seedling. And some herbs, dill, cilantro, yeah, you can transplant them, but it, for me, it's just not worth it. Uh, when to buy seedlings instead of make your own or try to direct seed. Um, when you've got a limited setup, you know, you just can't provide the heat to get them started very well, or you don't have enough light, or you're having issues with timing where you don't have enough space. You know, I've started these ones and I was hoping to move them out, but to have room to start these ones. And I just haven't been able to do that. Therefore, I can't start these ones. I'll just go buy seedlings. Uh, it happens to all of us. Sometimes you just lose, you know, I lost my tomatoes or I lost my cucumbers. It didn't, I, they got diseased or I started them too early or something happens. And then back to those seed availability issues this year, you may not be able to get the varieties you want, um, but most of our farms are buying larger packages. And so those are still very available. They're able to start things. Uh, there's a link here. I imagine that Anna or Hillary is putting that in the chat, and that goes to one of our web pages of just a map that shows where to get seedlings that are certified organic all over Maine. Um, and uh, it is, you know, if it, you, there's also a cost benefit um, getting your own seedling startup, you know, buying lights, if you buy heat mats, you buy soil, you buy containers. You're putting a lot of money in it, and it's not just the cost of the seeds you bought. But that being said, if you do it every year for many years, and those first initial investments kind of get amortized out, and so it really is just the new potting mix, the new seeds, and then everything else, you know, and the, the little bit of electricity that you're using. Um, and uh, so it can be very affordable to raise your own, but you're not getting ripped off buying seedlings from a farmer. Um, they're paying for a lot of propane, a lot of, uh, of their experience and knowledge, making a very healthy transplant for you. So it's not, it's not a, a bad deal. Um, I just don't, you know, don't feel like it's a failure if you have to, if you were trying to start your own and you ended up buying a couple tomatoes. Uh, it's not a failure at all. It's, it's uh, just part of how we do it. Um, so, into seeds and seedling biology. Seeds are a sleeping baby with a lunchbox and a coat of armor. That coat of armor is the seed coat. You can kind of see here's a, a bean that I soaked the other day. Um, there's the seed coat and the water has to get through that and different crops it's harder for that water to start soaking in but most of our vegetable crops it just starts immediately. Um, things like morning glories, you might have to nick the seeds, like some people use a, a fingernail clipper or they, they rub the seed on sandpaper to thin out that seed coat just so water can get in and start the process. So water comes in, there's a little baby plant in there. Here's the little baby root and here are the little baby leaves. Um, and then these right here are the cotyledons. That's the big part of the seed and that's the lunchbox. That's the food that's going to feed the baby plant. And uh, here's an onion seed, and right now these are two examples of the big breakdown in most of our garden seeds. Um, the, one, the bean right here is an example of what's called a dicot. Uh, it means there's two of these energy sources, and this onion seed is, is an example of what's called a monocot, meaning there's one cotyledon. It's one of those, and we're going to get into that a little more. So if you look at all these plant families from really primitive green algae and mosses, to the flowering plants, which is what most of our garden plants are, monocots and dicots, like what I was just saying. And that is short for monocotyledon and dicotyledon, but you don't have to worry about that. You can say monocot, dicot, or uh, here's an example on the left of a dicot, a broadleaf plant. You may have heard that, broadleafed plants versus grasses. So on the left is a tomato plant, 
uh, you know, if you think of most garden plants, there's a tap root, maybe a stem, individual leaves that come off the stem at distinct points called nodes, and flowers that come off the stem at distinct points called nodes and fruits. Grasses, monocots are a little different. There's not too many garden plants that are them, but onion family, onions, leeks, garlic, chives, uh, and corn are the big ones. Um, asparagus too, but that's a different talk because those are perennials. Um, so if we look at, at grasses, one of the big things, and, and you can really see it with the onion here, right? The stem is very compressed. So each one of these wrappers is a leaf and they all come off of a stem that's just down here at the base of the plant. And then there's fibrous roots. They often have a different root system. So there's differences uh, between broadleafed plants and grasses, dicots and monocots. Um, and there's a lot to go into there, but we're, we're going to have to, you know, stay at sort of a surface level. So here's your classic dicot. Why it's a dicot? Uh, it's because it has those two cotyledons. That's the energy source. And so you see down here at the bottom, those are the cotyledons. There's the seed coat that lets the, that either, that sort of slows the water, because the plant, you know, it wants the seed to germinate when it's a good time to germinate. You don't want it to happen while it's still on the plant and things like that. So it, it, uh, there's a reason why it slows the water coming in. Then the radical is just the fancy name for the first root tip that's going to grow. And then there's the first leaves that are going to pop out at some point. And it, basically, it's an embryo. It's a, a baby plant. Then when we look at our onion seed example, here's our dry seed. You can see the radical is emerging, that root. And then here's a diagram that looks into it a little more. Uh, lots of crops, we're just kind of looking at one example. Every species is going to be a little bit different. They all do things a little differently, but this gets us in the ballpark, right? So here's the interesting thing with onions. That root grows out, and you can see in this example, the root tissue is, is colored white. And then there's the cotyledon, that's just the store, that's feeding, that's what gets things started. But the tr first true leaf and that little compressed stem is down there in the middle. So when your onion seed is planted, you plant it in the soil, this thing's going to pop out of the soil and then go back down in, and that's going to root itself. And oftentimes the, the seed coat gets left hanging at the top of the seedlings, um, and, and it'll go on from there. So as we look at many of our common seedlings, uh, they do, they, it's, it's going to vary a little bit depending on how deep you plant the seed. But this is a good example of like a squash or a bean plant. You plant the seed, it sends out its radical, and it often pops the cotyledons up out of the soil. Uh, and then, so there's your cotyledons, and they look like the first leaves, but they're not true leaves. And you have the first true leaves growing and it just goes from there. Uh, here's an example of a squash plant where the squash was seeded. It wasn't too far below the surface, but it actually has probably moved itself up a little bit. The root has gone back down. You can see it's white and it has these little root initiation coming off of it. And you can see the cotyledons are still stuck in that seed coat. And, and many times when they emerge, uh, the seed coat kind of holds on and, and I probably should leave them alone, but I, I have a bad habit of trying to pull those seed coats off just because, again, I rush spring. So here's some probably cucumbers, and they've already popped up, and they brought their seed coat up with them. Whereas peas and corn do things a little differently, where the cotyledon stays under the soil the entire time. So the root comes out, and then a shoot comes out from there. And so in a pea plant, you get uh, they're, they're, it's a broadleaf plant, so then you get broad leaves coming off of that. But the cotyledons and the seed just stays under the soil. Uh, and in a corn plant, you, that's your stem. That's where your growth point is for the first half of that plant's life. It really doesn't, that stem doesn't elongate until it's getting ready to flower. Uh, and so peas, you know, this is also just a, a tip that I, I throw in. If you're if you want to get them started, soak them overnight. And look, it's already started that process of greening up, getting the, the plant enzymes and, and uh, life force, basically. The life is, is kicking up. It's, it's wakening up. And um, it's going to start getting that, that radical to start to emerge. 
and it just speeds things up a little bit when you're either direct seeding them or seeding them to transplant. So I actually planted some uh, just in my windowsill just to take pictures for this presentation. So I did this several weeks ago. Uh, and this also is a nice example of like how easy it can be to get started if you want. Uh, you can see some of these seeds I didn't plant very deep and they are now above the surface of the soil. Uh, but here on the right in that center cell, you can see there's the seed, there's the root going down and the shoot going up, but the cotyledons just stay where they were. Yeah, and here's another example of the cotyledon. So it's a dicot, there's two cotyledons and then the shoot coming up. Uh, and you can see pretty small plant. It's already rooted to the bottom of that little cell. That's about the stage that this is an ideal time to, to transplant it out. Um, clearly, I'm not actually doing that. I've already thrown these in the compost, um, but I got my pictures out of it. So that gets us into kind of like that ideal time. Our seedling roots, yeah, what you see is the, the leaves and the tops, but the really important thing with seedlings is what's happening in the roots and under the surface that you can't see. So these roots, um, you can see in my little cheesy diagram here, basically everything below the cotyledon I made white and everything above I made green. So if we're looking at that white part, it's the $5 word is the hypocotyl um, versus the epicotyl, which is everything above the cotyledons. But everything below it, it needs something to support it. That's what your potting mix is providing, support. So those roots anchor it and it can hold itself up. It needs water. We all know plants need water. One of the things a lot of new growers don't take into account as much as they should is that plants need air and their roots need air. Uh, their root, you know, the, the leaves take in carbon dioxide and breathe that oxygen. They also take in oxygen, uh, just like you or I do, to respire their food. Um, that's, that's how they burn their energy. Uh, and so that's happening in the roots. So that, that potting mix has to have air space and room for air for healthy roots. Uh, and then you have the fertility is coming to the plant from that potting mix. And then space. Uh, I didn't word that really well, but the plant needs space, uh, each one. And Different plants are going to need more or less. Um, onion plants really have just a fibrous root system. It just goes down. It's not very deep. You can actually crowd them pretty, pretty tightly. Something like a tomato plant, it is going to take over whatever root space you give it. So if we look at this last picture where, see my horrible drawing where I've thrown in lots of tiny lines, that's a plant that's starting to get root bound. It, the roots have really explored the entire space of potting mix that they've been given. That means they've maybe used up a lot of the fertility that's there. Um, and also, if you move them from there, they might have gotten stuck in a circle and they can actually have a hard time getting out and exploring the, the soil that you plant them into. And here's an example of those same peas a little later. And this I would still plant out, it would be fine, but you can see it's starting to just take on the shape of the container it was in. And the roots are starting to just go in a circle and they can kind of get a little stuck. This is an indicating to me that plant probably should have already been planted out. Um, just a tip, when you do plant them out, it depends on the, the species. Some of them, they don't want you to disturb their roots at all. Peas are gonna tolerate it pretty well. You would maybe like tickle those roots loose so that they are more likely to branch out. Um, so another topic in terms of like what size container. In that orange box, consider that a small cell like I put up my peas into. In the bigger brown container, think of that as like, you're like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get things really, I'm gonna start things early. I'm gonna put them in a big container so that it can really fill it. And you put your seed right in the middle of it. That can lead to issues. Say we're watering. All right, here's our water coming in. Look at, <laughs> how much of the, 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 the seed is going to suck up the water around it. And so that's going to remove the water you're adding, which is good. But if you're in a really big container, there's so much more water that you just added than what the seed will take up. And basically, you've also forced out all the air. So you need potting mix that will hold that water, but also let some of it drain and leave some air spaces. 
And if you're planting a seed into a really big pot, you're likely going to have it sitting in too much water with not enough air, and there's a really good chance it can just rot. So instead, uh, it's really nice to start in a, if you're going to go for a longer time with your seed, again, this is where one of those, it's crop by crop, like peas, this is not worth doing in my book. But if you're doing tomatoes, you don't start in those four inch pots and put a, a seed right in the middle because that's a really small seed. It's only gonna take up a little bit of water and it's gonna be sitting in wet soil for a long time. So you usually start it maybe in a, a, an open tray. And then once it's gotten a little bit bigger, you know, this is my, my little diagram of a, a slightly larger seedling that started to get some roots. Um, you don't wanna let it get too far out there because you don't wanna be damaging those roots as you transplant it. So it, this is where a little bit of experience comes in. You gotta play around and learn and see what works well. But if you can get it started and then put it in the bigger pot, then you've got some leaves which are helping to move that water back out of the soil because water is always going through the plant from the roots up into the leaves. Um, it's gonna do better. So that's not actually what's happening here, but we're gonna pretend that's what's happening here. Uh, this is one way a lot of farms start, like you, these could be broccolis and you would have them. And that's about the stage you would want to then, it's called pricking. You would prick them out and transplant them into their own individual cells, um, whether that be an eight pack or a, a three inch pot or something like that. Um, yeah, so that's what's happened with these tomatoes. These have been recently transplanted. Uh, and that's about the stage you want to do it at. Now. Personally, when I do this, because everything below those cotyledons is kind of like root tissue, it will root very readily in just about every species. So if you have cotyledons visible, I put those just above the surface of the potting mix. And sometimes that means you have to make a little bit bigger hole and you have to bend carefully so that you're not snapping the stem. Um, and, and that whole thing will root out from there. Uh, but this way, they've got their tomatoes started. This also takes care of the issue of, I planted a seed there and nothing came up, and now I just have an empty cell, and do I plant another seed? Is it going to be far behind everything? You can just get them started in one tray. It'll take up less space, and then a week later, maybe, you have seedlings that you can transplant out and take up a little more space, but it's giving you some time. Uh, and, and what I was just mentioning about that, that below the cotyledon, here's my, I forgot that I drew this. Um, so uh, that's about how deep I would plant it, right? Have those seed leaves up there and then just fill this area in with a little more potting mix. Uh, and this is not a, a garden seedling, but this was a picture of a house plant that I thought really shows another thing that we talk about a bit. And it, again, it's crop specific, but with tomatoes particularly, you'll hear this a lot. If your tomato seedlings get too tall, when you plant them out in the garden, you can plant them pretty deep and they will reroot from the stem. Um, tomatoes are an even more rare case because they'll just send out roots from pretty much any part of the stem. But most plants, if they're going to send out extra roots, it's from a node. So if remember, we talked a little bit about broadleaf plants. They have a, a section of stem called an inner node. And then there's a node where things happen, basically. That's where there's cells that are ready to go and grow. So that's where leaves come from on this jade plant. And you can see this jade plant is also happy to send out roots. Um, that's why it's so easy to take cuttings from them. By no means does this work with every garden plant. It's, but uh, just, so you, just so you have that background as you're looking and learning about garden plants and which ones it does work with and which ones it doesn't. So what do we need to get started? You need a container of some sort. You gotta hold that potting mix at some way. Uh, and then you need to consider that drainage, right? You don't want the water peeing out on your floor um, and ruining your, your carpets, but you also don't want it to just sit there and then your, your plant is just sitting in water. So you want it to be able to drain to a, usually a secondary container. Um, so often it's a tray at the bottom that has no holes in it, and then your container has holes at the bottom to let it drain out. Uh, a potting mix or a seed starting mix. And there's many of these available. Uh, every hardware store, every garden center is gonna have some that you can buy. You can make your own. Mofka has a fact sheet on how to make your own mix. Um, 
for me, it's not worth it to make my own. I just buy one. Um, and there's some that are more peat based, peat moss based, or coir, which is a coconut fiber, and some that are more compost based, where they use a commercial compost. But those tend to have peat mixed in as well, or coir. Um, and, and so that gets into some specifics, and you might want to try some versus others. Uh, you're going to need light. And most of the time, for a new gardener, it's more than you think. Um, what is enough light for us inside our homes, it's still not the same as enough light to really drive photosynthesis to a high capacity. Uh, if you think about plants in the middle of the summer, they're getting a ton of light, and it's very direct, and it's uh, very powerful. If anybody owns solar panels and you watch the production, you know, a somewhat sunny day versus a very sunny day, it's a huge difference. Um, it's just a lot more actual energy from the photons coming from the sun. Uh, and inside our homes, we can try to recreate that a bit. And, and you kind of have to, to have a good healthy seedling. Heat, that can vary. The most important time you need the heat is when you have that little seed and you need it to grow quickly so it gets, it, it is most vulnerable when it's just germinating and that radical is coming out. Um, that's when diseases can really get at it. After it's emerged and it's got leaves and it's making its own energy, it starts to build its defenses. It starts to produce enough energy that it can fight things off as well as energy it can give to good microbes that help protect it. So if you have a seed that just sits in the potting mix for a long time, it's a lot more likely to succumb to disease. Um, we, we tend to call those diseases damping off. Um, and, and so you want that to, to get up and out of the mix as fast as you can. And, and heat is also just gonna, uh, growth is limited by heat uh, in many times. You know, you can have too much heat, but in the spring, we're usually talking about it not being warm enough and the plants won't grow as fast. Um, and that can get you into trouble too. If you have a lot of heat, a lot of light, and a lot of fertility, and a lot of water, and super ideal conditions, you can get seedlings that are too big too fast because you didn't realize they were going to grow that fast. Um, so most homes will be, it depends on what, what temperature you keep your, at, your house at, um, where in the house you keep your seedlings. But if you're worried, you can always have a warmer spot to germinate things, and it doesn't even necessarily have to have light and then you can move them to somewhere where it's a little bit cooler, but you know, above 65 is, is ideal. You'd rather be above 65. If you can get close to 70, you're gonna be in the right range for most of your crops. You know, they'd rather be at 75, but uh, for the most part, it's gonna work okay. And of course you need your seeds, which again, this year, it's a little harder than some, but they're out there. So <laughs> here's my peas again. You can get started. And for something where I, it, I wouldn't have to let it grow that long and I could just transplant it out, um, a, a sunny windowsill is fine. For something like this, you can see they're near a sunny window, but off on the right side of that picture, you might see this shiny silver part. That is a grow light and they're providing some supplemental light as well. Um, in terms of containers, yeah, that was the other thing about this is that there's lots of plastic containers, which most of our farms are using something like this. Um, there's many home versions available. Some are the exact same thing as a farmer uses. Some are slightly different. There's, there's so many options, uh, too many to get into. Um, you can make your own, you know, old milk containers at a school, um, old plastic cups or plastic bottles. There can be issues with these. Uh, I, my main thing is that most people forget to add drainage holes, and so they hold too much water, and there's not enough air for the plant. Um, you can make your own out of newspaper. Um, this one, again, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully, if we have time, we can look at some more photos from the same exact setup, where I, I'll show some of the issues with this. I think it's just holding too much water. Um, and and the, contain, the pot that that person made is a little bit too big for the seeds that they put into it. It would have been a great thing to transplant um, a small seedling into. I did this last year. Um, this is one of those things that, uh, oh, also, you know, we're talking about like organic gardening where it's not really certified. Um, our certified organic farms can use newspaper they probably could not use milk containers because there might be some adhesives that um, 
aren't necessarily, uh, that, that might have a, a slight synthetic in them. Uh, for the home gardener, it probably doesn't matter, but if you're worried, um, you know, go with plastic, go with a peat pot, go with something else. I did uh, toilet paper rolls. I just cut the ends and folded them under. See, I, I left a nice big hole for drainage, filled them with potting mix, uh, and that worked fine. Um, here are some peat pots. You see uh, where it's compressed peat, and that will biodegrade outside. Uh, I also use plastic containers. I, I kind of use, I'm a mishmash person. Um, here's a, a picture from one of our Mafka publications um, about starting seeds indoors and you, just little plastic containers. Uh, because of this picture this year, I'm going to use little plastic containers that the mushrooms I buy at, at Hannaford's come in. That's what I'm going to put my, my onions in, but I'm going to cut some holes to make sure it can drain. Soil blocks are another option. This is one where you don't actually have a container around each individual cell, but you do have a bigger container just to contain the water that you're watering them. And so these are sort of compressed potting mix. And uh, this is the device that, that people often buy where you, you pack that full of the potting mix and then you squeeze that plunger and it pushes it out onto your tray. So I was just visiting a farmer and this is how they're doing theirs. Some people swear by this. I don't bother. It's not a bad thing. It's a great thing to do. I find that I can do just as well with containers. It really is a personal choice. Um, and by all means, experiment. These soil blockers can be a little expensive to buy right off the bat. So that's why I tell people, you know, like probably not the first thing you jump to, but uh, I also don't want to discourage people doing it because you can get some great transplants this way as well. And when you get your potting mix, I'm realizing I need to be quick here. So hopefully I don't go too fast. Slow me down if I'm, if I'm too fast. Otherwise we can touch on things again. So your potting mix, your seedling mix, uh, most of them are, have a base of peat moss. It holds moisture. It usually helps have some good air space, uh, dries out pretty well. It is a little acidic, so they usually add lime to it to balance out that, that pH. Quar is a, a coconut product that is replacing peat for a lot of people. Um, some people don't like the performance, but it, peat is sort of a mind thing. It's ancient, it's ancient moss, whereas quar is um, a byproduct of coconut industry. Vermiculite is an exploded volcanic rock. You add that to your mix and, and it can help improve the air. Uh, it can also help hold water a little bit and it can exchange nutrients like fertility. Uh, perlite, similar, um, you can add to, to vermiculite. A lot of mixes have fertilizer added in. For organic growers, you just want to see that it says OMRI listed, OMRI, OMRI, um, and that means that it's been approved for use for organic growing. Um, but again, your home garden isn't certified, so work with whatever works for you. Uh, and a lot of these mixes are compost-based, and that's actually providing the fertility. So some of the popular ones are um, Living Acres makes a potting mix, and that's a, a main-based compost, compost company that makes a potting mix. Uh, Vermont Compost is another popular one, and that's a Vermont-based compost company that makes a potting mix. And there's so many others. Um, lots and lots of options. Coast of Maine, um, Moo Grow, it's another Vermont company that makes compost. Uh, many, many options out there. <laughs> there Gail, just to butt yes. in with one question, a couple people asking about using ProMix for seed starting. Mm -hmm. So ProMix is peat moss. They probably also make some different formulations where it's quar. Um, some of them might add compost, but I think most of them have uh, fertilizers added in. And you can get organic versions of ProMix. Uh, if you just get, if you go to a garden center and say, I want ProMix, they're going to give you the conventional one and it has the equivalent of Miracle Grow mixed in. If you ask for an organic ProMix, they are going to give you one where the fertilizers are like alfalfa meal and maybe blood meal, maybe Chilean nitrate or guano or something. Uh, or usually it's a blend of many things that is providing the fertility. Uh, so ProMix is, it is a brand name, but for a lot of people, it's kind of like Kleenex where it started out as a brand name, but there's a lot of different companies that make similar mixes and everybody just kind of calls it ProMix. And then for your lights, 
Um, there's so many different setups. If you Google like seedling light setup, you'll see lots of options. This is one that somebody made out of wood. Uh, you can see the lights are just these sort of cheap LEDs that she bought online. Uh, I'm gonna say just to, to, for that light discussion to make it really quick, cheap LEDs are what I recommend. Um, seedlings in the spring, you're not trying to grow them all the way to flowering and maturity and making the fruit. It doesn't have to be a perfect source of light. LED shop lights are inexpensive. That being said, if you already have fluorescent lights with grow lights or something that your parents used or that you used previously, uh, don't throw them out and change them out. Those are fine. Those are great. And they don't use that much more energy than an LED. Uh, and there's a lot more options that get fancier and more complicated. And you can do that if you want. I don't know that it, the juice is worth the squeeze in my book. So one thing I like about the setup is just the, it's solid. You can fit your plants under there for a while. One thing I don't like is that look at those plants. They're getting to the, the they've maxed out the height allowed. They're bumping up against the lights and you got to move them. Um, whereas if you can move either the lights or the shelves, uh, you have a lot more flexibility. So here's one where they bought fancy LEDs. This is a, a farmer uh, that I know. And the reason they are pinkish is because plants don't use every bit of the light spectrum. So the theory here is that you only give them the red and you only give them the blue. Uh, but the thing is that they do still use other parts of the light spectrum. So I actually don't think this is a great option. And these lights tend to cost a lot more than just a white shop light. So, uh, so light spectrums, you can, you can, and color spectrums, you can get into, it's a big rabbit hole. Uh, but for my, my distillation, um, most cool white shop lights are gonna be fine. Um, LED shop lights you buy at Ocean State Job Lots, Home Depot, whatever. Uh, but you can see, sorry, coming back to this, that these lights are the height and the depth at which they are above from the seedlings is adjustable. And that's great because you want to keep the lights pretty close to the plants to really make it super bright. The other thing that you should notice here is look how bright that is, even though it's not white. Um, that's a lot of light going to those plants. Here's another one, um, and I don't know, this might be fluorescent, might be LED, doesn't really matter. It's a nice little setup. Um, so they've got their, their pots, they've got a, a tray to catch the water, but that means the pots can drain out at least down into that tray. And they've got their lights, everything's adjustable. They can let the plants get bigger or, or move the lights if they need to. Uh, here's one where, you know, for heat, the light is mostly coming from their window. The heat is right there. It's the wood stove. That can actually be too much. It can be too hot, too drying. Uh, but it just shows you there's, there's lots of options. This other one on the right, there's heat mats. Um, so you can buy heat mats where you throw a little, well, it depends on which ones. I like to make sure that there's a soil probe thermostat. And you put the soil probe in the potting mix, and then you can really it'll turn the heat mat on or off depending on the temperature of that root zone. And it's the heat around the roots that really helps the plant grow. Um, and again, I only worry about that when I'm germinating. My house is usually, we have a wood, wood heat and most days we're above 70 degrees whether we like it or not. Um, so my plants are fine. Um, and at night they get down to 65, they're fine. Uh, even if they get down to 60, they're mostly gonna be fine. Uh, and then the other big question is, when do you start? There are so many seed starting calories calendars to start from. So, you know, just take a look at a few, see where they agree, where they disagree, make your decisions. Um, I'm gonna show you a few just now and I, we have some links to them. And then keep your own records. What worked for you? What are you gonna try differently? Oh, you know what? My, my squash was too big, I'm gonna plant it later. Uh, or I'm trying a new system and I want a bigger plant, so I'm going to start them earlier. Whatever it is, you can start from there. And then, but as a general rule, especially for beginners, starting later than you meant to is usually going to be better than starting too early and getting something that's too big. It, it's, and 
your backup insurance is go buy a seedling from somebody at a, at a farm or a nursery where they started it at a, at a good appropriate time. So here's a Mofka uh, calendar of when to start seeds. And you can see, you know, March, you can start celery, celeriac, onions and leeks. We're saying, you know, anywhere from late February to mid-March. You can even start later. You can start in late March with your onions and leeks. Um, some of these are just sort of when you can start versus when you should start. And some of these are more of when you should. And, and you'll get to see lots of different options there. But I assume someone will put the link in for this one. Here's High Mowing, the seed company. They have a planting chart for you. Uh, and you know, this is about here, here's when to transplant, here's when to direct seed, things like that. Um, Johnny's has a nice cal calculator where if you know your, your frost free date, and here we're assuming it's June 1st, um, but if you know when the last, when, when your, your safe planting out date or when you're no longer expected to have frost, um, when in doubt, push it out a little bit longer. Because just because you're not expected to have a frost in late May doesn't mean you won't have a frost in early June. That happened last year for a lot of people where there was a, a frost June 1st or so, and it caught a lot of people off guard and they had to go cover their gardens. Uh, whereas if they just waited one more week, would never have been an issue. Uh, so then into some of the common issues, damping off, that's the disease I was talking about. It's actually several different soil diseases. Um, they, it's, they're, often described as thriving in cold wet soil a better description might be that they're more tolerant of that than the good bacteria and the good fungus that usually outcompetes them so if you have a compost based soil mix there should be a lot of good healthy soil life as long as you keep it warm and don't let it get too soggy you don't overwater it those good bacteria and fungi should outcompete the diseases that cause damping off and hopefully your seedling grows faster and gets out of the soil before it, it can succumb. Um, overgrown, that's when you, you know, it becomes root bound, also called pot bound, where it's just been in the container for too long. Uh, leggy seedlings, that's where you don't have enough light. It, this kind of overlaps with being overgrown, because if you just move them outside faster, they don't get the chance to get leggy. Uh, so if you don't have enough light to add to supplement, um, try not to hold your seedlings indoors for too long. Just try to, to start them a little later so that they're ready to go out while they're still small. But uh, if it's not light, bright enough light, the plants think they're in a shady spot and so they stretch. They grow really tall and skinny and they reach. They're trying to get above weeds or whatever. They, you know, they don't know what they're growing and they just assume there's a bunch of plants around them shading them out. So they stretch and try to get up to the sunlight. Uh, and that gives you a seedling that is weak, it's thin and floppy, and it can be more susceptible to pests and diseases. So you really want to avoid that whenever you can. And then hardening off is the process of getting your seedlings that were just babied indoors ready for the harsh wide world outside. So if you take something that has had no airflow and only the brightest light you can give, but nowhere near as bright and as hot as the sun is, and you just throw it outside and you know water it once and say, good luck, you may not have great success. So you start, the best way is to take these seedlings, well, the best way is to um, provide them with as bright a light as possible. And if you have like an oscillating fan, something to just provide airflow and move those plants, it's gonna help a lot uh, because Actually, one of the things that happens is the, the seeds, the, the plants have a waxy cuticle. They have an outer layer and that protects them from drying out too fast. But that takes energy to produce. And so if they're indoors and there's no wind on them, they don't sense the need for that and they don't produce a very thick waxy outer layer. Um, so then when you move that plant that really doesn't have a tough skin is one way to think of it and put it out and then just the mildest breeze to you or me is like going to a, the other side of the world for that plant and it will dry out quickly as well as maybe get too much sun suddenly. So anything you can do to, re, to, to more closely mimic those conditions in your seedlings after they're up, you know, blast them with light 
get some some airflow on them so they develop that that tougher skin the better they're going to do and then the next thing is to move them outside into those conditions that for the first time for an hour or less maybe not even and then move them back to somewhere a little more protected and then the next day a little longer and the next day a little longer and they're getting acclimated to those conditions so you don't want to just go oh gosh my plants are too big i got to go plant them right now there are other ways to mitigate that. You can put row covers, really irrigate them well, or move them outside somewhere that's kind of shady. So then they're only getting used to the wind before they get blasted by the sun, things like that. So here's an example of damping off. There's a tomato seedling. Here's the oops, same tomato seedling. You can see uh, that stem is, there's no real recovery. That, that's a dead tomato. And again, I think a bigger plant going into that would be better. They also maybe kept their potting mix too wet. And maybe it was just occasionally some of these potting mixes don't have a great blend of microbes. You sometimes get a bad batch of compost where it just, you don't have the conditions you want. Uh, and that's a real shame. It's kind of hard to avoid. You can get some beneficial microbes you can add to your potting mix. And there's lots of products out there. Um, but if you have a good healthy compost, you shouldn't need those products. You should have a lot of good healthy bacteria and, and fungi. Here's another example, some probably lettuce seedlings and they're damping off. Uh, uh, oftentimes you won't even see the seedling emerge. It will have already died before it made its way out of the soil. These ones have made their way out of the soil and then they got infected pretty bad. Uh, here's again, uh, you know, roots that are, are a little too much. Uh, it's getting pot bound there. I would still plant it. it, it it's doable. Uh, so this is again, that was probably the third time I showed you this photo of those peas, but here's another angle. Uh, you can see when it's just the window, look at how they're stretching and they're already, you know, they've only been up out of the soil for a day or two and they're already like, nope, I gotta go find that light. Um, if I, I can rotate that tray so that now they stretch and go the other way to reach towards that light. But as they're curving like that, that what's happening is the side that's away from the light is actually those cells are dividing more and they're expand each cell is getting bigger so that side gets a lot longer and so if you rotate it then the other side gets a lot longer and you're just kind of going back and forth back and forth over correcting and your plant is going to get really tall more so than you want uh it's better to have light from above i mean it's better to have like mimic true outdoor conditions and have mostly light from above but also from all sides but there's only so much we can do so uh light from above directly above is best this is uh really big squash seedlings that i put out to harden off and i left them out for too long that first day and so that is actually a sunburn that is called photo oxidative stress there's too much light the plant can't handle it because it wasn't prepared for those high light conditions it was living in low light conditions and you can one reason, way you can tell it's that and not something else. Do so you see this kind of line here? That's where the upper leaf overlaps the lower leaf, shading it and protecting it from the that sun. Uh, this is another one where here's a pepper seedling. It just got transplanted out and it's already suffered. This is called wind whip. Um, it's a transplant shock where so the seedling it only has a little root ball. It has a lot of leaves. So it only has a little bit of, of water reservoir and a lot of leaves demanding that water. Bright sun, it's going into a plastic mulch in this picture on a farm, so that's really hot. So that's another reason why it needs more water availability. So it, this probably could have been avoided if the seedling had had more watering, but um, it, or just more hardening off. Um, that can be hard to do on a farm scale. It's, it's actually one of the advantages we have as gardeners is we can baby our transplants a little more, give them a gentler uh, transition than many farmers are able to. So that's the end of the main presentation. And I do have more photos that we can get into of just like, yeah, you know, here's some setups. We can look at oh, why, was it, why does this work well, or why does this maybe not work well, or we can just go into questions. I can see there's a lot of them. Yeah, there are a ton of questions. So maybe we should start with at least a good chunk of those. It would be great to see your other photos too, if we have time, Caleb. Um, so let's see, where to start? Maybe thinking back to early on when you were talking about starting your own peas, 
a couple people were wondering um, about how much sooner you get to harvest, like how, how worth it it is, I guess, and also whether using row cover would make any difference. And sort of to tie into that, we had a general question about the use of row cover and what you would recommend. Okay, so there's a lot there. <laughs> um, but this, the pea seeds, I, it's not something, I, you know, I only kind of bring it up as an example because that pea variety is actually one that I'm breeding. And so I'm trying to get as much time for the seed to develop and mature and become a dry pea seed. Uh, and, and also for the flowers to be something that I can manipulate uh, earlier in the season before I'm too busy. So that's a very specific instance. However, the seeds that I planted uh, near the same time, directly in the soil of just ones, you know, sugar snaps that we were gonna use for ourselves, um, a lot of them didn't come up at all. Uh, and the ones that did come up, they just, they grew so slowly because it was really early, it was really cold. Um, so if you want that first taste of summer of those sugar snaps, it is probably gonna buy you a week or two, maybe a couple weeks. Um, but uh, I'm not saying that it's necessarily the thing to do. Um, row cover, is going to help in a lot of these situations. So for folks who are trying to get things coming out of the garden sooner, right? They're trying to get the, the, the first garden taste. Uh, row cover, uh, especially for new gardeners here, it's it's called, uh, well, there's a lot of different companies. Um, Rime, Agrabon, uh, Taipar, Covertan. Taipar, that actually might be something else, uh, but that's okay. Um, Floating row cover is the general term. It's spun bound polyester, meaning it's not really woven. It's just sort of like this weird fabric that they make out of it. And it, it will, uh, you, you cover the plants with it either directly on them or better yet, you make some sort of hoop structure to protect, to hold it up over them. And it basically creates a mini greenhouse and you make a little microclimate and it'll help warm the soil underneath the plant. It'll help make warmer airspace um, and it'll help hold that heat in overnight. Cause really, you know, those beautiful spring days are so nice. And then we go in in our warm homes and it gets really cold that night, even if it doesn't freeze, you know, it gets down to the forties. Um, and that can, uh, that can really slow down our plants. Just keeping it a little bit warmer makes them grow a bit faster. Uh, there's a lot to talk about with row cover there, but uh, that's a, another talk, I think. Yeah, I think that was, that was a great synopsis. Thanks, Caleb. Um, we had a number of questions too about the practice of pre-soaking seeds. One person wondering uh, about onions or anything else where you'd recommend doing that. I would just give it a quick Google first for whichever crop you're thinking of and just see, uh, you're gonna find people online that say, oh, I did it and it was great. Or you might find some people who say, I did it and it was terrible. Uh, the one thing that's probably always going to be true is don't soak them for too long uh, because anytime they're all the way underwater, they're not exposed to oxygen. And that's fine for a little bit, but like when I'm doing peas to, to plant, I try to only do it overnight and no longer. Um, they can probably go for a full 24 hours, but why bother? They've already taken up a lot of water and they're, they're ready to go. Um, but I, I would say, you know, if you're wondering about it for tomatoes or not, I, it's for, I don't do it for too many crops, but if I was going to do tomatoes, I would Google it first and just see if people have had successes or not. Cause I honestly don't know if it's a problem or, or if it's a real help. I would assume it's not a problem if you just get them, pre-soak them for a little while, not too long. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I'm going to just read out one question about legginess. I know you've talked about it a little bit, but we had a few questions from people who have that problem. So Jennifer had said, uh, when I try to start tomatoes, they look nice for a while, then they get skinny and tip over. I have a starter heat pad under them, and I've been told lots of things like too much water, um, the light too far away, but nothing works. Do you have any, oh. any thoughts? Yeah. Uh the heat is helping them grow after they've germinated. It depends on the, the temperature of the room, but if you're in that 65 to 70 range, I would just turn the heat off, take away the heat, because that is going to encourage the plant to keep growing. Um, the other thing to consider is 
experiment with adding more light. Just try it out for, for a little while and see if that makes a difference. You might have really high nitrogen fertility. Sometimes nitrogen can make things a little leggier, a little faster. Um, and then uh, try a fan. Um, because not only does that fan help them get that tougher skin, but actually plants respond, or and maybe daily come in and just tickle the tops. Uh, it's, they actually respond to that motion and that movement, and it will make them divert some of the energy that they were going to use to grow taller and skinnier, and it will make them grow a little thicker. Um, and so it's always good to have a, a a stockier transplant, not always. It's usually good to have a stockier transplant. Um, it's going to be a little stronger. So, you know, let them think they're in a windy environment and they're not going to be quite as tall. But the trick is if you start doing that after they've already gotten tall and leggy and skinny, then you're probably just going to have a bunch of seedlings that have flopped over and some of them might have even snapped at that point. It's really hard to come back from legginess. You really want to prevent it before it happens. Same thing with damping off. You know, people are like, oh, my plant's damped off. What can I do? Uh, honestly, your best bet is to start over. Um, and uh, legginess, you can, you can live with it up to a point. So I'm not saying throw out leggy seedlings, um, but it's better to, to prevent it than it is to try to fix it after the fact. Uh, the watering thing shouldn't be that much of an issue. Uh, it really just, you need to give the plant as much water as it needs, but you don't want to give it more than it needs. Um, I don't know, I've never heard of that connected with legginess, but I, I wonder if um, uh, saturated roots, you know, they can maybe root rot a little, that might interact with it a little bit. And then one last thing, if you're really, really, really trying to combat legginess in tomatoes, I don't think this is worth it for most people in a home setting because there's only so much you're gonna do for your setup. But if you wanna more closely control the daytime temperature and the nighttime temperature to make sure they're about the same range, because the difference, the bigger the difference between daytime temperature and nighttime temperature, the leggier and taller tomato seedlings are gonna grow. But that's like, advanced and, and most people it's not worth even thinking about that but it wouldn't hurt to to try to make a more uh consistent uniform temperature that they're growing in hmm. that's really interesting thanks caleb um we had a couple of questions that are about like what to do when you're taking your seedlings outside to actually plant them like should you um tickle the roots out or cut or tear the roots or gently brush the roots or what do you recommend for for that it's it's going to depend on the crop um, melons are ones that really do not want you to disturb their roots um, so you're going to just try to put them as gently as you can you know out of the container and into the soil and and hopefully they haven't gotten root bound at all that's part of the reason why you don't want to start them too early i'd rather put a small melon plant out than a big melon plant. Um, I want those roots to still be exploring and get ready to just go into the surrounding soil. Uh, tomatoes, you can get pretty aggressive with tomatoes and you can, you know, I will sometimes I'll pull them out or if they're in a, a, a peat pot, I'll just rip the bottom off of it. I'll rip the sides off. I might cut those roots and let them branch out a bit. So it's going to vary crop by crop. Um, Onions, you'll find with onion seedlings, part of why I don't mind growing them in a tray is that even if you have them in individual cells, you pull them out to plant, and most of the time that potting mix is gonna fall out from around the roots. They just have these big, thick, fibrous roots that uh, don't really latch on to the soil the same way that a lot of other plants do. Um, and so it kind of doesn't matter. You're just going to be throwing in a plant with its roots into a hole. Um, so it, it, it is going to be a lot crop by crop. Um, so again, Google's your friend. Uh, if you're having issues with one specific crop, then maybe you need to look into it more, do some research, or just try to be more gentle and see if that makes a difference the next year. OK, great. Um, we had a few people asking about using inoculants or boosters of any kind with beans and peas. Do you have any recommendations there? 
Yeah, so beans and peas are legumes, and that means that they can fix their own nitrogen from the atmosphere with the help of bacteria that live in the soil. So the inoculant for a legume is the specific bacteria that's going to take atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into a form that the plant can use at, in lieu of some fertility. Um, most leg legumes can do this. Uh, they all have different bacteria. Peas and beans use pretty much the same bacteria, I believe. Uh, so if you want your legume to be fixing nitrogen, if you've been growing beans and peas in the same garden plot for years, there's a good chance you already have that bacteria in the soil, but the inoculant is a really good insurance to make sure that you're gonna have, you, you put it on the seed. And that means when that root emerges, boom, there's the bacteria right there. And it actually infects the roots in fact, isn't always a bad thing. In this case, it's a good thing. Um, and it will uh, make sure that they're fixing nitrogen. That being said, peas are better at it than beans. Beans don't actually fix all that much of their own nitrogen. And you know, if you have, if you've already fertilized your garden, the plants aren't gonna, it's a trade-off for them. They're taking solar energy, making sugar, giving it to this bacteria. The bacteria is giving them nitrogen. If there's enough nitrogen in the soil, no way are they sharing that sugar that they made from that, that uh, solar activity. I mean, it varies a bit by species. Some of them don't have as good a control over it, but some of them will straight up kill off the nodules on the roots where those bacteria are living. So if you've already fertilized your garden a lot, that inoculants not a bad thing, it's a good thing, but it also maybe isn't worth um, worrying about too much. Where things get trickier is with other bacteria ones where it's like beneficial, it might help protect against damping off. Those are usually good. Um, sometimes it's not necessary, like a good healthy compost uh, really should do the same thing. Um, but there are some commercial products um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a big topic. Sometimes I worry about how much some of them cost and whether they're really helpful versus just say compost um, and having good conditions like a, a well draining soil and enough compost, you've usually done the same things. But that said, I don't know that it's a bad thing either. Okay. Great, thanks Caleb. Um, we also got a lot of questions about light and heat amounts in different situations. But one big one was, um, do you recommend leaving the lights on 24 hours a day? Or if not, how many hours is ideal? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so again, because we're just trying to get things from seed to being able to go out into the garden, uh, there are a lot of crops that are sensitive to the length of the day, and that influences when they flower. Um, uh, as, as marijuana and hemp are much more popular right now, there's probably a lot of uh, people, when you, you Google things about lighting and how many hours in the day, those are the first things that you're going to see pop up because that actually influences whether when it turns into a flower and, and makes the bud. Um, and that's true for a lot of other garden plants, right? I was saying the day length is what um, influences when onions bulb up. But when they're just seedlings, um, cannabis aside, that's a, that's a different topic. But for garden crop, for most edible garden crops, um, it, it doesn't really matter. You can't go too long. Um, that being said, it's not a bad thing to turn off the lights overnight um, or to have them on timers so that there's at least four hours of dark. Um, but as long as and on the other side, I, I would want them to have at least 12 hours of light, uh, but you can leave them on as long as you want, and it's usually not going to be a problem. It, again, it can vary a little bit crop by crop, but for most of the garden crops, it's not going to be a problem. It's not, your tomatoes and your peppers are going to be like, awesome, I'll just keep growing. <laughs> okay, great. That's encouraging. Um, a couple of questions just about containers. Would you recommend egg cartons? And if you're using one of your toilet paper roll types, do you cut off the toilet paper roll before you plant the seedling in the garden? Um, so egg cartons, it's a really small amount of soil they can hold usually. So for a very, and, and you really would only wanna put like a small seeded crop like, like basil or something. 
And I wouldn't leave it in there for very long because it's going to exhaust its supply. The other thing that's going to happen is it, they don't drain that well. Even though they're cardboard, you think of cardboard as just going to let water go through, it actually holds water pretty well. And uh, you're going to have saturated, soggy potting soil, and your roots are going to be pretty well dead. If you remember the photos I took of those, um, ooh, this reminds me. Uh, it, the, the, here we are. <laughs> so this is newspaper pots, and they're in a milk carton. Great. I love the resourcefulness, the thriftiness. Um, and they've got probably tomato or pepper seedlings coming up. Uh, and you can see there's multiple seeds per, per pot. Um, again, that newspaper, you would think it would just let all the water out. It really doesn't. And so you get a soggy pot. And by the time the plants are a little bit bigger, um, yeah, they, they've cut off the seedlings that they, you know, so they've thinned it down to one seedling per pot. Um, you can tell by that, that paper, it's not looking good. And you can also tell that it, it's gotten a little wet. These are the same seedlings. Look at the ones on the left versus the tomatoes on the right. Um, that yellowness means it's not getting enough nitrogen. I think it's the same potting mix. So there was the same amount of nitrogen in this potting soil. But when your roots rot, then you don't have roots to take up the nitrogen. Also, when your potting mix stays wet, you can lose the nitrogen. It can turn into a gaseous form and go off into the atmosphere. Um, and if you uh, have a lot of water, you can leach it out of the soil. So I don't want to say don't you do those things, but just really keep an eye on how wet that potting mix is. Keep an eye on the roots. Um, what I was saying earlier was if you remember my pictures of the pea seedlings and the pea roots, those were nice, bright, white roots. That means they're healthy. If they start looking brown and slimy, you are in a bad spot. They're just too wet, and, and it's hard to come back from that. Not impossible, but hard. Uh, and then for my toilet paper ones, I think by the time I transplanted them out, basically what happened, they'd been soaking for so long, the cardboard just sort of unwrapped. And so it, I just unpeeled it and put them in. I don't even remember what I had planted. Uh, I think it was a broccoli. I think it was broccolis. Okay, great. Um, one person wondering, um, when you see the the number of days to maturity, does that include the the time that's required for hardening off? Um, that's a good question. I'm not 100% sure. I think probably not. And it also depends because people harden off to various... Um, various degrees. I think there, and, and when you transplant a seedling, there is a, um, an amount of transplant shock. We do our best to avoid it, but those seedlings get, they get shocked. They sort of like, just like you or I do when we're, sh we're suffering a trauma of some sort, we kind of shut down for a little bit before we can get going again. Um, and different crops will do that to a different extent. Um, I think most of those numbers where they say 75 days to maturity after transplant, it really is after transplant. So hardening off would be considered before transplanting, I guess is, I think that's, that's my, my best understanding. Okay, yeah, that's helpful. Um, uh, oh yeah, a question about using the fan. Um, is, is, is there a time that's too early to start having the fan on? Do you recommend that like after the seedlings have reached a certain size? So it depends on um, your availability to keep an eye on the water <laughs> because the fan is also going to help dry out the surface of the potting mix, which is a benefit unless you're not there to keep it from getting too dried out. Um, but if you're there to prevent it from getting too dried out, it's not going to hurt anything at all because basically as soon as that seedling emerges, it's like, whoa, there's passing air. I'm losing moisture uh, and I will, I need to toughen up my skin. And from the get go, it'll be in that mode. Uh, that being said, it's maybe best to make sure the roots have gotten into the soil and uh, that they're really starting to get to, to be able to take up that water. Cause if the root is only in the top, centimeter of potting mix. That's the part of the potting mix that dries out first, and you want that to dry out periodically. Uh, but 
the plant still needs to be able to take up water. So that's when it's more susceptible to drying out um, versus when it's bigger and it has a bigger root system that can take up water readily. So it wouldn't hurt to wait until, you know, you've got some, some true leaves emerging beyond just the cotyledons. But as soon as the cotyledons are up, honestly, you know, it's nice if you have a couple extra seedlings and you can pull one up here and there to keep an eye on things. And if you kill it along the way, it's not that much of a loss, hopefully. Uh, and you can kind of see where the root, the root development is. Um, but yeah, I mean, cotyledons, I wouldn't mind having a fan on them as long as I felt that the roots were getting enough water. And would you leave the fan on just for like a couple hours every day or do you want it really going for a long time? I think you, it's, you're going to have an impact even if you just do it for an hour or two. That okay. being said, uh, and if you had one fan going from one direction constantly, the plants are going to just develop to be protected from, they're like, oh, the wind always comes from this side. Those cells on that side of the plant are going to toughen up. You got to move it around or got, have an oscillating fan. Those are the really nice because they mix the air. They, they change the direction it's coming from. So yeah, I, uh, at least a couple hours. It, because it helps take care of the humidity, it helps dry things out. It's good to have fans going more, more often than not. Um, it also helps to make the, the temperature a little more uniform because it mixes the air around. Great. We're down to our last five minutes, amazingly. Um, so I'll try to sneak in a couple more questions. Um, okay, so one that we have here is with winter squash, you had sort of been on the fence about whether that was worth um, starting in, indoors, if I'm remembering correctly. But this person was wondering, is it worth it to have more mature plants that you're planting out so that they're more able, able to survive insect pressure? Yeah, this is one of those things where it's, there's no wrong answer. Um, a, oftentimes, it, this has been, many gardeners have played with this and have reported that by the time you, your transplant really gets over the transplant shock and it gets going, the, the seed that you direct seeded next to it, uh, you know, within a week, either before or after the time you put the transplant in, uh, they usually kind of catch up and they're, almost equivalent a lot of the time, and sometimes one does a little better than the other. But for something like cucumber beetles, where they can transmit bacterial wilt to your squash, the squash is most susceptible when it's smaller. So that is one reason why it's really nice to have a larger plant that uh, before the cucumber beetle has a chance to find it, it can, it can bite it, feed on it, and infect it with that bacteria that causes uh, sudden wilt. Um, that being said, even if you have a pretty good sized transplant, they're not immune to cucumber beetles. For me, I'd rather row cover them and protect them from cucumber beetles that way. So I'd rather either direct seed or transplant. I mean, I'm still going to do transplants just because I like to know how many seeds have come up so that I don't put them in the garden and just like cross my fingers and hope they all make it. I like to know that I have this many ready to go. Um, and then I row cover them to protect them from cucumber beetles. Uh, so, you know, it, it's not that one way is wrong or, or right. It's just, you got to make it work for your system, what you're ready to do. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, two more questions I, I see here. Um, one person just wondering like how many inches off the tops of your plants you want your grow light. If if you know of an ideal. Yeah, it varies a little bit light to light, but typically, um, and it also varies, LEDs are a little more directed, so it, it, they can be a little higher up so that they're, they kind of encompass your whole tray. Um, but as long, the, if you remember that picture I showed of the sunburnt squash leaf, as long as you're not getting that, you're not too close. <laughs> um, you can get really, really close. Fluorescent tubes get a little hotter, uh, and so those you want to keep an inch or two above just so that they're not really cooking the leaves. Um, and then other types of lights can be a lot hotter and those have to be further away, but they're usually brighter lights anyway um, and, and fairly energy intensive. Most folks are going to LEDs and fluorescent tubes. 
and those can be pretty close. Great. Um, you too. Cora wondering, um, should onion and shallot seedlings be cut back to make them stockier? Uh, you know, I don't know that it's a, a should I do it, um, mostly because I get these lanky seedlings. And uh, the thing is, is that because they're grasses, they're not truly grasses, but they're in that, that monocot type, their growth point is way down in the soil. Um, so you can trim the tops off just like you're mowing the lawn and new leaves are going to keep growing. It's not going to affect it at all. In fact, the leaf that you cut is going to keep growing because it's not growing from the end. It's growing from, from further down the length of the leaf. So I like to do it just to keep things manageable, <laughs> but it can help make them stockier. Uh, at least that's the theory. Okay, great. And I'm going to call this our last question. Um, a couple people asking what your thoughts on using humidity domes are. Good, good question. I meant to bring that up. Um, it can be helpful for that early seedling stage. Like we were talking about with the fan, you don't want it to dry out before it has a chance to really get roots in. Um, but other than that, it's just a recipe for disease. <laughs> so I don't keep humidity, like the plant doesn't need that much humidity most of the time. It's just that you don't want that very beginning seedling to dry out, uh, unless you're grafting plants. But that's a very advanced topic and, and that's a whole nother situation. So many topics for another day. Um, I, thanks a lot, Caleb. It's 1.30. I think that we had better finish this off. Um, but lots of people putting into the chat their, their appreciation for all, everything that you've shared today. It's been a huge amount. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I think that we might be able to launch a very quick poll just before we all log off to get people's, uh, a couple items of people's feedback. If Anna is able to launch that poll, that would be great. Do, are people seeing that? Yeah, Anna already launched it. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> poll is launched. Um, great. Well, um, keep an eye on the Mofka website if you're interested in more webinars because we will have lots more coming up this spring and summer.